We're going straight into our next session with Mrs. Rodake Akikube Villani. Rodake Akikube Villani is the Chief Commercial Officer of Next Africa and a highly sought after international speaker, panelist, writer, and thought leader. Rodake has been featured on the BBC, the CNBC, and other international platforms where she's often called on to review the global energy markets, the economy in general, and present summaries of events, trends, and emerging themes. Rodake is an engaging and passionate communicator. Noted for her astute analysis and ability to communicate complex economic and business concepts to audiences comprising senior business leaders and decision makers. Realizing her tremendous skills, she established IRGO8, an effective communication platform in January 2020 to coach on evenings and weekends. And I've seen this demand skyrocket of her services, for her services. A prolific writer, thought leader, Rodake has been on a regular, she's been a regular reviewer of global newspaper headlines on BBC World News TV and, and since 2012. As a reputable energy, infrastructure, and investment executive, Rodake was recognized in the United Nations MEPA Top 100 Most Influential People of Africa Descent. On the is here to speak with us today. And what she knows how to do that. She didn't put a rise in there. My sister here is on the rise these days. Hold on for her. Thank you so much, Josh. Wow. I was like, when is that going to finish? <laughs> but so good to be with you here. I see one familiar face in the back there. <laughs> um, I hope you've all had a, a really great day. Yeah. So I'm going to spend the next hour sort of talking to you about overcoming your fear of public speaking. So I want to start by painting a scenario. So right now, under your seats, there are some seats that have been tagged with words. And what if I told you that if you look under your seat and you put your hand on and you bring out a paper and you find a word, you have to come out and speak on that word for 10 minutes. No. Do you want to look under your seats? <laughs> no, 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 there's nothing under the seats. Oh, okay. But how many of you, just the thought of that, filled you with a bit of anxiety? How many of you genuinely? How many of you genuinely? Just the thought of even doing that. Coming out here to stand and speak spontaneously. Is everyone being honest? This side of the room, they're cool. They're okay. <laughs> this side of the room, they're awful. But this side of the room, okay. Yeah. But I guess that is really what this conversation is about. There's something about speaking publicly that a lot of us, you know, get filled with fear and trepidation. In some instances, you know, you get sweaty palms, you start shaking, your voice starts to crack, you imagine the worst case scenario, you start thinking about how you look, your appearance, basically 100% of anything that could possibly go wrong, you imagine. So what is it about public speaking that fills up with so much trepidation? coming out? Is it about standing out? Is it about not knowing the right thing to say? Is it about feeling like we're not quite prepared? So I remember in 2019, when I had my, my son, who's now almost four, I remember it was quite a dramatic episode. Um, I had been prepped for labor. I'm going to go into a bit of detail. So if you don't like gore, don't uh, Just cope. <laughs> cope in the moment. Being prepped for labor, had my music on, you know, and people had given me all these books. You know, everybody gives you books, natural childbirth, this or that. Anyway, for any woman who hasn't been down that road, I threw all of that out when she came to shop. But I remember everything was going swimming well, doctors were coming to check in, dilation, you know. It's just one of those moments, the dream kind of <laughs> childbirth process. And I was kind of dozing in and out of sleep. I was playing superwoman, I told them I didn't want an epidural because the yeah, arm had like that. And that I was going to try and do the breathing and maybe get the oxygen because that can help to sort of dissipate the pain. So at some point, things started to change. I was like, these contractions, man. I was still playing Hat Girl, turning on the music. And I dozed off for a while. Next thing you know, 
I heard the hospital door slam open and someone shouted, Mrs. Villani, Mrs. Villani, we have to rush you to the theater. And I wake up and I'm like, what the heck is going on? At that point, it actually became a Nollywood movie. Mm -hmm. I kid you not. About 10 people rushed into the room. And if you know how these wards work, this was in the US at a hospital called Howard. They're monitoring you from outside. Your baby's heart beats and everything. They're monitoring from outside. So literally about 10 different types of specialists rush into the room and the bed I'm lying on, it's like a normal bed, but it's amazing how they, that bed quickly tracks it. It's kind of, they turned it, it was like transformer. It turned into a bed they were wheeling. At that point, my mom and my husband, I didn't even know where they were in the room. It was all a blur. My life came flashing in front of me and I said to myself, I had my, my son, what most people would consider quite late. I had my son at 38, um, almost 39. So I said to myself, I was telling God, I waited all these while, all these years. Is it all going to just end like this? And I'll go back to Nigeria and they'll ask, where's the baby? <laughs> so in that moment, all sorts of things were flashing to my mind. I remember they wheeled me out of the ward straight to the theater. I didn't have time. It was just crazy. And I remember while they were even wheeling me, they slammed my leg into the door. It was literally like a car race. I got into the theater, I had my gynecologist, a lovely Nigerian woman, all that doctors that I brought, called Dr. Bada. Sure. And Dr. Fumi Bada was shouting at her staff in the theater, we have, I think she said we have five minutes. So she started to count down because once you're in the theater and you have to go in for an emergency section, they have a limited amount of time. All I'm hearing is spatula, check, knife, check. And I'm thinking, what are these people waiting for? Anyway, to cut a long story short, I don't want to bore you with all the detail, is I eventually, um, actually one important piece of information that I missed out is when the contractions had started, I actually then told them, you know what, I'll take the epidural now. So they gave me the epidural, which is very simple, it's when they put that big injection into your back, and the person who gave me the epidural, it's just to cite the information, is actually Ethiopian. So one of the other minor pieces of details, not ready to not relevant to the crux of what I'm trying to say is that actually that hospital had mostly African doctors. That's the reality, African and Asian. So he gave me the epidural, which kind of numbed me, and that was when I fell, fell asleep. And I'm lucky that I took the epidural there, because if I was going to be rushed to the theater, they would have put me under general anesthetic. But all they needed to do was top up the anesthesia um, by the time I got to the theater. So she had counted down, and she was shouting, I'm going in, I'm going in, I'm going in. She shouted, went in. Of course, I couldn't see anything because there's like this huge curtain in front of her face. I could hear my mom screaming. She wasn't screaming, she was praying. She was calling my dad. She was barely legible. They were asking what was going on. They said, Grandma, put on your scrubs. Put on your scrubs. She didn't make any time. They cut me. They go in. They bring out the baby. I'm there looking at the anesthesiologist saying, what's going on? I didn't hear a single thing. And I'm like, Okay, this is a lifetime. What is, you're meant to hear a baby cry. You're meant to hear nothing happened for what felt like two to three minutes. And then I think almost three minutes after, I had this loud cry and scream. And then the tears just flowed. I started to cry, just relief and everything. And they took him away because they needed to check in. They were just stunned as to what could just have suddenly gone wrong. And and the physiologist was comforting me, be okay, be okay. The reason I share this story actually, with all the detail and drama in there, is really the significance of that cry and that scream. That cry and that scream is something that we've been taught that is a sign of life, right? So everybody knows the sound of a baby that has just come out, being born into the world. If the baby doesn't cry, or scream or shout, there's something fundamentally wrong. Or you think, so that is what you look out for. So the big question I ask is, what happens to us from the time we are born to when we start to hit this age of adolescents, teenagers, where our voices suddenly shrink? Because that is how we came into the world, right? There is something innate in all of us as human beings that means we want to announce ourselves. We want to express who we are. 
It is an innate thing. So when people talk about is public speaking nurture or nature, my answer is it's both. And I'll tell you why. And this story illustrates the nature part of it. Which means everybody has an innate ability to speak. Right? But you have to nurture yourself into acquiring the skill to refine that innate ability. So a baby is born, you all come out kicking and screaming and shouting. And by the time you reach the age of three, four, five, six, most of us have grown up, grown up in traditional Nigerian households. Somebody is telling you, shh, use your quiet voice. Children should be seen and not heard. Don't speak loudly. Why are you always talking, talking, talking? That is environmental. Subconsciously, by the time you reach secondary school, you know, I have, my son is almost four now. He asks questions upon questions upon questions. And because I'm now a public speaking coach, I'm very conscious about what I say to him when he's shouting and when he's screaming and how I calm him down. I would never tell him, stop talking. No, I will sit down and have a conversation. Because now, as, I, as a parent, who is coaching public speaking, and I speak and counsel students when they come to me for consultation, many of them point to things that started years ago in their childhood, which have somehow framed their minds around their ability to speak or not speak. So for those of you who are parents, or parents in the future or desire to be, that is one lesson. Then we go through primary school, we're still a bit of boy in By the time we get to the teenage years, the peer pressure of, I want to belong. I don't necessarily want to stand out too much. I want to blend in. And that pressure goes beyond clothes or drinks or maybe the drugs and alcohol. That pressure is now more psychological. And so the point I'm trying to make is, in adulthood, this is my estimate that 89% of our challenges and fear about public speaking started many, many years ago. And many of us cannot even trace the root. And much of this is unconscious. And that is what a foundation I wanted to lay. For some of us, not for all of us. If you've done all the lessons, and you've heard the beautiful talks like this that have inspired and empowered you, and you still can't get over your fear, or supposed fear of public speaking, some people may need to dig deeper. And I often have times that people come to me, I want to learn how to be a better speaker, by the time I finish talking to them and counseling them, or coaching them, or consulting them, I realize their problem is actually not public speaking, it's something else. There's some other issue going on that requires a higher level of counseling, which I can't deal with. I know it all sounds spooky, you're probably wondering, well, like, why did you all go into that? So, I've talked about the origins. The second part of it is social conditioning, which is slightly similar. One of the tools or techniques that I used for myself in the very early days, and one of the reasons I had to do this, if you knew me in the early days, I'm going to be very into conference, I'm asking a question, and I'm literally sounding like this. My name is, well, I can't, I can't believe it. And the question, that was me. And it's hard to imagine now. I'm not even the one speaking. I'm just asking a question. And in that moment, I have to work myself up into a stupor to even sum up on someone up the courage in a crowd to raise my hand up. Each step is like a major opening. <laughs> Before I summon up the courage to say, can I ask a question? Right Now, there's an element of social conditioning. So if I want to ask a few of you in this room, when moments like that happen, what are some of the things you fear? Just maybe voice them out. I don't know if there's another mic. Yes. Yes. There's no right or wrong answer. Usually perception. Okay. Perception, yes. Oh, there's a leg in your hand. Or maybe you could say your name before you also. I'm ABC. Okay. My name is called Sola. So if you're about to say rubbish. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Perception, saying rubbish. Anybody else? Good afternoon, my name is Tony. The fear of um, your words just tumbling around. <laughs> 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 yeah, that, that's my fear. Yeah. Um, my name is Tony. I think it's the fear of what if I'm saying what I'm thinking wrong. 
Okay. So same as same rubbish. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, for me, anytime I'm giving the opportunity to speak, because again, I tend to be active in the church organization. So I'm always afraid of, because I know this, all of this, you know, there's really a structural speech, don't get people lost. And for me, people have to be lost. People do tell me that, see, it's also you are completely that. Stand. <laughs> 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 so basically, not making sense, yeah. sort of losing your train of thought. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so my name is Irene. I'm a as my standard this is something that they I just go blank and I just say good that they are not the Okay. Any any more contributions? Okay, we'll take one more, the last one here. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ozzy. I think the fear is when to stop conversation conversating with people. Okay. When to stop conversating with people. Okay. Yeah. When to stop speaking. Okay. So all of you have picked up the mic, you've all talked. On the face of it, you all, you all sound like you don't have a problem at all. <laughs> contributing your opinions here in this context of the room. Why do you think that is? I mean, you've all said all these things, and I've asked you a question, and you boldly come to the mic to speak. Is it because I forced you? So why do you think it is that you were just able to express yourself? I mean, yes. I think probably because it's becoming a familiar face. We started yesterday, so many of them have been here yesterday. Okay. Today. So maybe there's some, some sort of... Okay, all right. So one of the things, and this is why social conditioning is so important, one of the ways I started this conversation is to tell you a very relatable story. So I'm coming as a public speaker. I've told you a very well, relatable in so far as you understand human reactions to emotions, not that you've been in that exact same situation. And that story, to some extent, has helped you relax. For some of you, maybe not so much. But social conditioning actually goes a long way into the lay of your around public speaking. So let me give you my first concrete tip. Is you need to find what works for you and find your routine. I'll give you a very good example. I'm the type of speaker where if I come into a gathering or event, I like to, for want of a better term, consecrate myself, so separate myself from the environment I'm going to be speaking in. So I came in here, I could actually have sat in the back, but what works for me is I go somewhere separate. And in my house, especially at the height of COVID, my husband, my my family, they all knew that if Ralake has a speaking engagement, everybody has to scatter. <laughs> like, Literally, so I remember this one particular time I was going to do give a keynote on a webinar. This was at the height of COVID, and I told them what part of the house I wanted to do my webinar. No one should disturb me. And by the time I came down, I said, "My husband, he'd actually moved one of the pot of flowers. He put it on the table. He put coffee and tea and all of that for me." And I was laughing. I was like, "This man knows me so well. He knows that before I do that thing, I have to be completely relaxed." There's some other people. Before they get on the big stage or whatever it is, they need to be networking. They need to be chatting already. They need to be doing what sounds like speaking, right? And I figured out that what actually helps my nerves, me personally, because of my personality, and actually I'm more of an introvert than an extrovert, and I'll explain how that links to public speaking. I need to remove myself from people before I go to speak. If I don't, one of the first things that will be happening is I will never be present in a whatever conversation or moment because my thoughts are focused on what I'm going to be doing next. And secondly, I almost feel like if I'm talking, the strength and depth of what I want to say will be diluted by these conversations, right? Now, so you have to first of all figure out where the comfort zone is in terms of your preparation. And the preparation I'm referring to is just before. There's a preparation that happens in the weeks and months, but there's preparation related to just before that moment, where it is a predictable moment. Of course, there's scenarios where you haven't planned and somebody just says you should do something, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is, ask yourself where the anxiety, the nervousness, or the fear is coming from. Sometimes, Asking ourselves questions can actually help us unpeel the layers. I remember a very good friend of mine who is known to Tosh, actually. We're kind of the same sister circle. Um, 
we went to speak somewhere together. And of course, your friends, they all know your strengths. We know each other's strengths. And you know, they know me as a reasonably good public speaker. And I recall that before we went there, she was like, they put me right after all I came. <laughs> and we all have those moments. And for her, that was a thing. If you're coming to speak after someone you consider a good speaker, right? You've already articulated that situation. You've, you've made it a thing. And now, in that situation, nobody said that to her. She said that to herself. So she had already defined a situation that, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe Rolak is a better speaker. She may not be a better speaker, but she, maybe she expresses herself in a better way. I don't know. But she had already defined a situation that didn't need to be defined. And that may have created some bias in her mind around what she could do or achieve. For some other people, it may not even be what you say to yourself about your ability. It could be what someone else has said to you. And this is not even the stuff that goes from childhood. And there's a certain subconsciousness around our ability to do things. We may not be able to articulate this was what happened then. She said this to me yesterday. Somebody gave me criticism that was really negative. So when those moments of fear come in, we need to ask questions. Why am I suddenly nervous? I was okay, but all of a sudden, did I see something? Did I hear something? Did I watch Barack Obama on a YouTube video just before I came to this talk? And I said to myself, I could never measure up to that. Now, if you're that type of person like me, I would, if I knew a Barack Obama was speaking before me, I probably wouldn't come into the room, right? Because that's what, what works for me. I don't need to tell other people that's why I'm not in the room. Because the consciousness and knowledge of what has happened, now for some other people, it will inspire them. And that's okay. Which leads me to my third point about personality. Personality in public speaking is absolutely crucial. So how many of us have even tried to understand our personalities? Who are we? How do we like to work? When we practice for a talk or presentation, how do we do that? Are we the kind of person who goes in front of a mirror, records, looks at ourselves? Or are we the kind of person who wants family and friends? Tell me how I did. That's you. The second one is usually the extrovert type of move. The introvert doesn't want all that nonsense. They would rather actually just figure it out by themselves. So your personality is not only important in your delivery or your style of delivery, it's also important in how you prepare, right? And speaking of preparation, point number four is most people underestimate the power of preparation. And I watched a really interesting video, I think it was Bella Disu. And she was talking about Bella Disu, she's my Kadinuka's daughter, and she was reviewing her year. And she was talking about the fact that, especially women in the workplace, where we talk about career advancement, we often sometimes talk about the fact that people don't give us opportunities and we need to take our seat. They're not giving us a seat at the table, bring your own table and seat and all that, blah, blah. That's all good. But one of the points that she made that I thought was really, really insightful was, what if there's a knowledge gap? And most of us don't often think about that. What if there is a knowledge gap in two ways? The knowledge gap in terms of how to deliver the speech, and the knowledge gap in terms of your actual content, right? I take it for granted that you're your own subject matter expert. So usually when I coach, I don't spend time really talking to people about content. But the reality is sometimes what manifests as fear and anxiety is because we're not ready. And sometimes you need to be honest with yourself. Have that conversation. Have you done enough preparation? And perhaps next time you make the necessary adjustment. And sometimes you often don't know if you're ready until after the fact, right? So I think that was point number five. Yes, four. Was that four? four? Okay, that was point number four, number five. Okay, now something that often affects a lot of us. There are a lot of people here, if I ask you, do you like being the center of attention? How many people say yes? How many people say no? It's okay to be honest. It's not safe. 
You like being the center of attention. Yeah. I, I love that. <laughs> Sorry? Like, why would I disappear? Okay, so what sort of context do you like being the center of attention? Uh, like, the business discussions, winning. Okay. Like the winnings. Okay. Uh, and what context do you not like being the center of attention? Like, uh, when there's so much talk and it's not making sense and. When you are not making sense. No, like the people with the so much talk. Okay. okay. So I think what I hear you say is there needs to be a reason to be in the center of attention. Yeah. So, like, you're in a meeting, for instance. Yeah, I, I don't know no, please continue. Say so you're in a meeting. Would you want to just disappear into the meeting? Like, no. because what I meant was, I don't want to disappear in rooms. I find that room, you have to go and kill Leave your mark, right? Okay. So, um, there's this quote, and I'll explain how I link it to the center of attention. I think the way to think about it is to make your idea, not you, the center of attention, right? And the quote is, if you carry a message of hope and healing, your greatest responsibility is to get out of the way and let the message work its way through you. So when I think about people who really struggle, because there's some people I spend six, seven, eight weeks with, I coach them, give them scenarios, Sometimes they go for cancer, but they still struggle. Another way I put it to them is, if the essence of your message, if people's lives depended on the essence of your message, how would you deliver it? So if you knew that what you had to say or deliver, there was a lot at stake. If you didn't say it or deliver it, how would you deliver it? Would you put your fears and anxieties aside? You would because there's a lot at stake. So when you think about passion and purpose, and you know, it's the purpose part of public speaking, which is really important, which can help you overcome fear, is if you have a sense of purpose around why you're doing what you're doing, and what your intended outcome is, and what is at stake if you don't do it, it infuses a sense of life and renewed vigor into what you're doing. Right? And it doesn't always have to be dramatic situations that people will die if you don't talk. It's never really quite like that. I mean, there's some scenarios around that. You say someone finds themselves in a court of law and there's a lot of stakes, someone's about to be convicted or something. But mostly in our everyday lives, it's generally mundane things, things that have to do with what we care about. If you're trying to rally people to donate for a cause that you really believe in, how would you speak if you knew your target was one billionaire? You would speak with passion. And there's something about passion. When you're passionate about something, your level of self-consciousness drops. Right? And it goes back to this idea that I said about if you have a message to deliver, your greatest responsibility is to get out of the way. You get out of the way of that message and let the message work itself to you. So you can almost see yourself as a missionary. Right? You're a messenger who's going to deliver a gift to an audience or a group of listeners or stakeholders, whoever, whatever that context may be. So the sense of purpose should always be the big why question. And this I teach under a whole area of public speaking called the essence of public speaking. It's not just this thing we do because we want to sound eloquent, we want to win an election, we think we have good oratory skills. It is something that is really, I would say, existential. Absolutely existential. And if you think back to some of the great speeches, if you think back to, there's a guy in the UK called Enoch Powell. He talked about the rivers of blood. And it was one of those speeches that actually led people to go and try and kill other people. Almost created a race war. Because these were people who spoke with convi conviction. They really truly believed what they were saying. And of course, we know the great Martin Luther, right? We know his speech. Um, there was, what's his name? The former British Prime Minister that led the UK through. Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, he had a fantastic speech as well. So those things are absolutely really important. They had a sense of purpose. And a lot of those leaders, to be honest, some of the great speeches were born out of times that were really difficult 
in uh, global political and economic history. So these people were facing literally situations that could wipe out nations. So for them, the stakes were on a Richter scale that wasn't seen before. So the question for you is what are your stakes in your own little domain, in the areas that you speak about? And I'm sure many of those leaders would have been rich with fear. And you know the funny thing about fear? Fear and excitement really ride on the same hormone. That hormone is oxytocin, I think. Oxytocin is happiness. But apparently they have the same origins. Is it dopamine? <laughs> Dopamine. I knew oxytocin was a bit off. Yeah, I think it's dopamine actually. It is. So that adrenaline rush you get before you go on stage, or maybe you're graduating, you're about to climb on stage and shake the hands of the professor. They all come from the same origins. It's just the channeling that's different, right? So I actually always say is that, and I probably lost my list now. But you can tell me what number I am. The last thing I said was around the sense of purpose. Yes. yes. Yeah. I think I have about 14 or 15. I'm not going to be able to get through all of them. But I think I will give you enough to lay a foundation. And it's important to have just a slight bit of anxiety, no doubt. Just this one bit. Why? Who, who can tell me why? Keeps you sharp. Keeps you sharp. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's actually positive to have just a small bit of anxiety, not the crippling kind, but the kind that propels you. Because guess what? It's the same dopamine that's creating that feeling. Adrenaline. And someone once said, is it happiness and anger? Like, I don't know how they describe it, but yes. Two sides of the same coin. Yes. So, and in the moment, it keeps you on your toes. But in the long term, some level of self-doubt, and I caveat that heavily, some level of self-doubt helps you close your competency gaps, right? Because you always feel that you need to do better, you need to get better. The level of self-doubt which then spills into imposter syndrome and it starts to becoming an out talking negative to yourself, that's not the type we want. But the part we want is to realize that we're lifelong learners. So if your palms are just a bit sweaty, that's okay. There's nothing abnormal about that. So I also don't want you to live today thinking that if you're in a moment and you're not shaking, you're not doing anything, that is nah. We also don't want that because overconfidence too has its its own. Because and in fact, what that leads to is you end up developing blind spots. And it's important to know that self-awareness and self-consciousness are two different things. Self-awareness is absolutely important. The awareness of how you are feeling in that situation right now is key. And a lot of people are not even self-aware, which can be a killer because you run headlong into a situation and you don't really know what you're doing. So that's important. And then the other point I want to make is fear sometimes comes from a lack of control or the feeling of a lack of control. There was a time I used to be a really, really terrible fly at Trapla. <laughs> and I saw a video recently of a superstar that was really shaking on the flies. I was like, wow, this thing is really, it's everybody. Why do we have that sense of, it's beyond our control. None of us were trained as pilots. Maybe some of you were. But when you're on a plane and the plane is experiencing turbulence, are you going to go to the pilot and ask him, what are you doing? Why can't you fly this thing properly? <laughs> you're not going to. But somehow you got on that plane believing that the person in charge is capable. I can't be a pilot. I don't know how they do it. Sometimes I carry 300 people, 200 people. It's, you know, it's, it's a, I think it's a thankless task. And I understand why they have the strict rules. But the reality is the fear and anxiety sometimes when flying may come from a place of feeling like you're not in control of the situation. You don't know anything could happen. And none of us like not being in control. That's the reality. It takes a lot of effort and grace to fully surrender to things. And sometimes, when we find ourselves in a speaking scenario situation, there are many outside factors. I imagine worst case scenarios. And because I wear heels, I'm quite tall. Sometimes I think, 
climbing up the stairs when I fall. It's going to look really disastrous, <laughs> right? So sometimes the little details can throw us off, the things that happen, some, they take life. Maybe it's when you start speaking that the mic will decide not to work, your village people have come. <laughs> Why is it when you're speaking? Um, and, and the reason I identify that is, it goes back to this point about being able to figure out what is happening and why it's happening, why you're feeling the way you feel. And not many of us are in touch with our feelings or emotions, but I think self-awareness really, um, really, really helps. Then the final point I wanted to make, which is really, really related to probably point 11 or 12 now, is related to this idea of the knowledge gap. Is some of us don't even do it enough. So how many of you, the first time somebody asks you, you're going to be speaking around on this, what is your first reaction? How many of you gladly say, yeah, yippee, thank you. I'm looking forward to this. How many of us, that's our first reaction. The next time somebody says that, consciously try it differently. Actually express gratitude, express thanks for the opportunity, and tell them you're looking forward to it and you can't wait. I've invited you to speak somewhere. Even if it turns out that you're not available on the day, right? Which is more logistical. Let your first and next reaction be, wow, that's amazing. I'm really looking forward to this. I can't wait. Do you know why? Well, two words. There's a psychological impact. But the second thing is, I always say is like, once you commit yourself to a process, you'll be forced to do the work of preparation. You need to get because guess what? You set up expectations, right? And it's very important. I say, see an opportunity to speak. I already mentioned the word. See every invitation to speak as opportunity, not confrontation. And that's a note on which I want to end. I have a million more things I can say. Every invitation to speak to express yourself, to share your voice, should be viewed as an opportunity. Why? An opportunity to make money, an opportunity to submit a business proposal, an opportunity to let the world know who you are, to let the world know how fantastic you are, not confrontation. Part of the mindset challenge that many of us have is public speaking is seen as a battleground. Me against them. They're waiting for me to fail. If I don't use this word correctly, my grammar is not on point. Meanwhile, Half the time, the audience don't even care. And some of us will now get there, and the first thing we'll say is, oh, sorry, I have a bit of a call today, so I'm going to be on top form. I do the same call on my Instagram page. Sometimes I have on the I Articular page, how not to start a speech. Don't point to the flaws. Don't point to, nobody even notices that you have a cold. But guess what? Once you enter that zone, all the audience is going to be thinking of is, we wonder if that sneeze is going to prevent her from speaking well. So you have to walk in and go into that situation like on the room. And guess what? The person who invited you to speak is not stupid. Right? They're not stupid. They don't want you to embarrass them. So they know that you've got it within you to deliver. And then if you're the type of person is, what if the audience knows more than I do? So what? They don't know it the way I do, otherwise they would have invited them, right? True. Is, is that not true? True. Yeah. So we need a mindset change. And with this few words of mine, I hope I'm able to convince you that you can overcome your fear of public speaking. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, let's take some questions. Let's take a few questions. Let's take a few questions. Thank you so much, Mom. Um, me personally, when I grew up, I was a very timid person. I don't like to say anything. I just literally keep things. I may have things to say in my mind, but literally keep it. So I would like to ask, what uh, opportunities, public events, helped you grow personally for a startup or someone that wants to or find your inner self speaking publicly? Did you register for events? What assistance you major? What step did you take? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think for me, it was really the universe of friends and family because those situations kind of created a safe space for me to showcase myself, showcase who I am. I remember when I set up I Articulate in 2020, you know, in the previous years, a lot of people have been giving me feedback about 
my ability to speak and communicate and how I talk and all of that. And I was like, oh, this is interesting, but can I really turn it into a business? Sorry. Okay. No, still on your friends and families, we still have some people because I hear people say that it takes um, you to believe what you do for others to join the train of Absolutely. Life. So if you're starting for the first time, uh, people will definitely throw bad comments at you. Some people may not even give you the encouragement that you need. So is this still comfortable to push on? Of course. Happens? Have you not seen that reel on Instagram of that little child going through a tunnel? Has anybody seen it? So you know this um, water fountain is yes. where you go through a tunnel and you land in the water. So I think the child's dad is a yeah. toddler. The toddler's dad is there. The child pushes the dad and then the child then pushes itself. It's the cutest thing. And the caption was like, sometimes you just have to push yourself. And, and that's really it. I think it goes back to what I say about the voices. Now, there's something I call the virtuous visibility cycle, especially as a business owner and startup. The first step is to embrace and accept the opportunity to speak, right? And your reaction and what you say to yourself in that moment is key. Once you do that, even if people say you can't do it, use feedback as fodder, right? Once you do the feedback, you go away, you do the work, and you come back and you do it better. The reality is that the more you speak, the more you're visible, and the more people see you. Now, the more you know you're going to be visible and walking into rooms and corridors where you have to deliver, you then are forced to do the work. And the more you do the work, you then start to deliver excellently. And guess what? Once you start to deliver excellently, people start to invite you back. That's why I call it the virtuous cycle of visibility. It's, it's like a loop. But you have to take that first step. You can't be a business leader. How do you pitch for money or pitch for funds? But we also have to get our content right and do our homework. That's absolutely key. And sometimes you can also sign up for coaching, right? But I found that place of confidence through friends and family. And sometimes when I'm really in a place of self-doubt, even now at this stage, I get some invitations to speak and I'm just like, wow, okay. We don't believe you. <laughs> I know you won't believe me, but remember what I said about everybody has, there's, a, there's always a small aspect of everyone that feels like, mm, maybe I'm not. But guess what? The first thing is I make sure I will own my subject matter 100%. Let me even start by clearing that. 50% of the work is done. Once I hold my content and what I'm going to say, it is now in the delivery. And there's another tip for you. This is just Jara. Is KYA, know your audience, right? So as I came into this room, I sized up, OK, what are the type of people? Am I going to take a very academic approach? Am I going to take a more relaxed approach? And I start with the story. Well, fair enough, it's because I've been trained. So I understand how to kind of move people up and get them laughing and all of that. And I have a really good scenario. Let me share a quick story. Wimbiz 2020. Hey, oh, you weren't that? You weren't? No, this I last one. I, I remember. So I'm actually on the board of trustees of Wimbiz, but I first take some events on Wimbiz. So there's an annual debate at the conference where, and this last year's debate was to Jagba or not to Jagba. So on each side of the debate, they have two, two people. On the day of debate, one of the debaters is not turn up. Bear in mind, women's conference, over 2,000 women in their room. About two and a half hours before the debate, my phone starts to ring. I see the people that are reading my phone for you, Shabba that day. I was like, God, I know what's his problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I then get up and I say, ladies, when I say, Brother please, 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 Brother you have to help us. You have to step in. You have to step <laughs> I thought, okay, maybe if it's a moderate, it's fine. But you know me? I haven't been rehearsing this people since. I haven't spoken to Mother. I will not come and carry my head. You'll come and debate. I was even debating for Tujakba. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, Lord, why do you always do this to me? But I've been in those situations so many times. And I thought to myself, on the other debate, to make matters worse, my co-debater was going to be virtual. The other side, the two of them were physical. So that was another layer of complexity. I was like, I just had to calm myself. So in the two hours before the day, I was scribbling notes. I said, I can't start doing research. These guys have had weeks. And I said, this women is women. They like to laugh. They love humor. I'm not a natural funny person, but I know the energy of women's room. So I kind of quickly dimension the audience. I figured out what I'm going to do to get them to really fall in love, be on my side, hula, go crazy. So of course I came up with this crazy acronym for Jagba. 
gently accelerate progression and progress. <laughs> That was the inspiration in the moment, and of course, I, to cut a long story short, I went on and I did a bit. Till now, a lot of people just think I was part of the team, but not many people, except a part of planning committee, knew that I stood in for someone in the last two hours. Guess what? This is not to post. When they did the survey after the conference, I scored the highest. 93 out of all the other speakers that have been planning for months. Wow. And specifically on audience engagement, right? Now, obviously, I've had some training, I've had some all of that as a speaker, but the point I'm trying to make is that you need to know your audience. Because even if you're not prepared, if you can just say something that you think is people, if you're an audience of food lovers, why not start a story about food, even if you're pitching to raise money? Have you asked the organizers, who are these people in the room? What do they like? Or what are they about? What is their background? What are the things that make them tick? And then you engage them at that level. So that's another way. You have to disarm. I like to use that word. You disarm the people you're going to speak to. So that by the time you start speaking, even if you make mistakes, they're already written for you. So that's one strategy. Yeah, so I want to ask, what's the place of the tone of voice in public speaking? And at what point do you bring in a sense of humor? So imagine you're speaking, yes, just as you said, you need to understand the audience. But you realize that everybody's just like, okay, either they're too focused or... So at what point do you think you should bring in some... Even though you're not a comedian, you do not, but I know in the practice, there should be a way how you need to bring in some sort of sense of humor to calm the environment and ensure that the audience are connected back to you. Okay, so I, I always say to people that if you're not a naturally funny person, humor should not be your go-to go to strategy because it can be the most mortifying thing. <laughs> to try and make people laugh and they don't laugh. It's very embarrassing. It's very embarrassing. And the thing is, with humor, timing. If you're a naturally witty person, timing and your comebacks, the timing is actually key to comedy. Even stand-up comedians will, will, will agree. So, I think with humor, you can plan humor, and some people do. That's what stand-up comedy is, so they plan their humor, or they test it out on other people. But I would say that it's more important to be authentic, and just tell it as it is, than consciously trying to be funny. Because if you're authentic, people will probably naturally laugh with you. You know, human beings, what we seek in the context of public speaking, and even the audience don't realize it, is emotional connection. If you're more believable, it's something, and it's an Aristotelian principle called pathos, and you see it in words like empathy, sympathy, apathy. It has to do with connecting with people emotionally. Once you can connect with people emotionally, it's easy to get them to do anything. You can get them to cry, you can get them to laugh, you can get them to be. You know, so, but a lot of that comes from storytelling, telling true, authentic stories that illustrate the point. And this is something my husband was always says to me, well, okay, if all else feels, just don't let me story. Right? And that, people just find emotional connection with that. Tone of voice is something called vocal variety, which is absolutely key. I think the way I would say it is, if you, if what you're saying and the way you're saying it, are not in sync. Your audience will always believe your non-verbal signals first. So I can come to you and tell you, I'm really, really happy. Yeah. You're not gonna believe me because my body language or my tone of voice is not in sync with the expression of what I'm saying. So I think tone of voice is something you need to practice, but some things should come naturally if you have a sense of purpose. If you're trying to describe to somebody that something was really you just say it as it is to express it so that you can convey the message, right? But I think all of those things, if you look at the winning formulas, the combination of how you use your tone of voice, your hand gestures, how you connect with the audience, how you engage them. You know, in public speaking, the audience is also speaking too. So when I'm talking to you guys, I'm looking at nonverbal cues. I know the people who from the beginning have been really plugged in from the start. And I can decide in the middle of a speech, I'm suddenly going to shift gears. So I can walk up to this table here, because they've been the most quiet tables since I said speaking. <laughs> and I can suddenly do something that will shock them or surprise them. If I notice that somebody is on the 
mobile phone, I can just suddenly ask everyone, stand up guys, we're gonna engage each other. It's something called shifting gears. It's like when a teacher walks into a room at school and everybody's making noise. One of the ways teachers shift gears is they just, they're just silent and then the room goes quiet because they're like, okay, what's going on? So you can only shift gears successfully if you're in tune with what your audience is doing. Because communication is always two-way. They're, they're sending you messages. They're telling you when your time is up. They're telling you when you're waffling. And they don't need to talk to you to do that. So you have to be a master multitasker mentally as a speaker. No, I mean, in a big room, you're not going to be able to do that as effectively as here. But you can gauge the mood. So, yeah. so speaking is psychology. Yeah, I think speaking, a lot of it is psychology. It's actually human psychology. So I actually spend more time teaching on the philosophy of public speaking rather than telling you pronounce your word because all of that one is just, yeah, if you want to go to a diction and elocution coach, yeah, but my focus is really more around the psychology and essence of speaking. I don't want to spend time coaching people with this is how you pronounce words. That's not really the important stuff. Except you want to work in TV or something. <laughs> so.